Hi, my name's Chris Keefe. In the next couple of sections, I'll be speaking with you all about diversity analysis. Um, and we're going to start that pretty long and heavy topic with a short section on the core metrics pipeline. Uh, it's a really useful tool for calculating and visualizing both alpha and beta diversity, so within sample and between sample diversity metrics. Um, and makes a really good starting place for many analyses. During this section, we will be introducing that tooling, the core metrics and core metrics phylogenetic tooling. We'll be running Chime Diversity Core Metrics Phylogenetic and looking briefly at some other commands that are kind of related. Um, and we'll be, again, briefly exploring the resulting visualizations. Recently, you all have been busy uh, using the alpha rarefaction tool to plot alpha rarefaction and determine an appropriate sampling depth. This is going to be really useful both in this command and is an uh, important thing to remember for the rest of your analysis. Um, before I dive into doing any real work here, I'm going to just take a minute and set up my workspace. Uh, you may already have done most of these things, um, but this will give us all a chance to just refresh and for you to get up to speed if you haven't caught up already. So I'm going to start by going to Chrome Apps and opening the Secure Shell app. I will be just looking down through this to make sure everything looks right. I've already put in my username, Migratory Mole. You will have a different username, so make sure that yours doesn't look like mine. Um, and then I'll hit Enter and do my best to type in this password without making too many mistakes. All right, it looks like we're in good shape. Uh, now that we're here, the first thing I'm gonna do, and this is something I do constantly when I'm actually working at the command line, is clear the screen. It just makes it a lot easier to see what's going on. And so now we have a nice clean screen. I can use the ls command to see what's in the working directory where I'm currently located. Right now, there's just this workshop folder. I will navigate into workshop. And you should also do that. If you put your results somewhere else, they may not show up in the server properly. I'll use ls again. And this, once again, shows me all of the things in my directory. Now, if you're having trouble tracking all of this text on your screen, um, you can always hit clear and then ls again. And so now you're starting fresh, and all you've got there is your prompt, which says that you are working in home migratory mole workshop, or really for you, home your username workshop. The command that we ran is ls, and the three files in that directory workshop are this data 2 tablequza the metadata.tsv, and the treeqza. We'll talk about what those are uh, again, in a minute, you've already seen them, um, but this will give you a chance to just remember what's going on and learn a little more about them. The next thing I'm going to do is open up the workshop server because I'm going to want to use these files uh, in a way that I can't from the command line. So for that, I will type in workshop.chime2.org. I don't think that's right. I think it's workshop server.chime2.org. And that's not going to work because I haven't put in my username. So after workshop server.chime2.org, I'll type in migratory mole. And here I am at my index page. This page is, you'll notice, I'm going to click back over to secure shell. Um, you're looking at a directory called home migratory mole workshop, holding these three files, data2 table, metadata, TSV, and tree QZA. When I click back on the tab with the server in it, you'll notice that we've got those same three files, data2 table, metadata, TSV, and tree QZA. Uh, this just tells me that we're in the right place. We're looking at the same files in both systems, um, and we can start getting along with our work. So because we only have one command to run during this section, core metrics phylogenetic, and because that command can sometimes take a little while to run, 
though here it won't take long because we're using a very small data set. Um, I will start it running, and then we'll spend some time talking about what, what inputs it's taking. To do so, I will click on the copy button on this command block in the Parkinson's mouse tutorial, and then I will go back up to the tab that holds Secure Shell, click on that, and paste my command in. Everything looks nice and clean and tidy here. Um, so I will hit enter and then we will navigate away by clicking back on the tutorial. Um, so what did we just do? Looking at this command, we can break it down pretty quickly into its component parts. First, we're asking the terminal to run the program chime to use the plugin diversity and run the action core metrics phylogenetic, which in this case is a pipeline. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Core metrics phylogenetic takes a table as input, a phylogeny as input, metadata, a sampling depth integer, which you might recognize this is the 2000 sequence depth that we selected during the alpha rarefaction part of the tutorial. Um, and an output dir command. Again, we'll talk about output dir in just a minute, but for now I want to pause and talk about what these table, phylogeny, metadata, etc. actually are under the hood in Chime 2. Matt did a really great job of talking with you all about semantic types earlier, and this is a good opportunity for us to practice with that idea. Um, core metrics phylogenetic doesn't need a specific format of data, it just needs, it needs to know that the data it's taking in means that it is a table, it is a table, right? And there are a lot of different ways that you can structure a table so that a computer understands it. Um, Chime 2 groups all of those under the semantic type feature table. Um, how do I know that it's a feature table? Because I've used it a bunch of times. How would you know? You could look at the documentation. Um, I will do that in the browser now, and I'll show you how to do that in just a minute in the command line. Um, but I would go to docs.chime2.org after opening a new browser tab. Then once I get to this docs page, there are a few ways to find what I'm looking for, but I usually do this kind of the simplest way possible. And that is just scroll down until I find the plugins part of the table of contents. And then click on available plugins. Because Chime 2 thinks about all of its bioinformatics knowledge, if you will, in terms of what its plugins make available. If you want to know how to do a specific thing in Chime 2, you're always asking a plugin how it does that. Um, here, if we click back on our Parkinson's mouse tutorial tab, we can see once again that this is running the diversity plugin and its core metrics phylogenetic action. So when I go back to the docs, I'm on the available plugins page and I'm looking for diversity. They're in alphabetical order, so finding diversity is pretty easy. And finding core metrics phylogenetic doesn't take much longer. We just scroll down and we see that core metrics phylogenetic is here in the pipelines section of the documentation. I can click on that and it will tell me all of the things that this command needs to function. Significantly, it will tell me that it needs an input table, like we saw in our command, of type feature table frequency. There are a bunch of different ways to represent a feature table, but Chime 2 needs to know that this is a feature table before it allows core metrics phylogenetic to proceed. Um, and specifically a feature table of type frequency. Core metrics phylogenetic runs a number of different diversity metrics, some of which are capable of taking other subtypes of feature table. Uh, they use presence absence data instead of feature counts. 
or they can use relative frequencies instead of actual feature counts, true frequencies, right? Um, because core metrics phylogenetic needs to run a whole bunch of different things, it can only take in a feature table of frequencies. And that means that if you try to pass relative frequencies, for example, or even more so, um, presence absence data to core metrics phylogenetic, it will say, sorry, but that's not appropriate. Please give me feature table frequency. And that actually prevents you as a user from accidentally calculating things that are not meaningful. Um, if you calculate a metric that requires count data using presence absence data, if Chime 2 were to allow you to do that, you would get a result, but it wouldn't be meaningful. It would essentially be a lie about what your data looks like. Um, and that could really mix up your whole analysis. Um, so Chime 2 just makes it so that that can't happen and doesn't happen, which is really an amazing, amazing feature. Um, not, to, not to keep hitting the word feature too much. It's pun, pun not intended. This phylogeny input takes a rooted phylogeny um, so a phylogenetic tree of some kind. Um, and then our parameters take an integer, a metadata file, um, and an integer if we choose to run and jobs or threads to parallelize this command. We didn't have to do that here because our data set is rather small, but it's a useful thing to know about if you're using a lot of data. Now I'm going to click on the secure shell tab in my browser uh, just to confirm that our command actually ran and we've got all of this amazing green text so i think everything looks good we saved a whole bunch of new outputs we'll talk about those in just a minute before we do though um, i'm going to try to answer a question some of you may you may be thinking about right now um, i have this command that i'm trying to run i know it takes certain uh, semantic types as inputs, but like, how do I figure out what um, what what my data actually is? Like, what the type of my data actually is? So I have cleared my screen here. I'm gonna type ls to see my uh, see what's in my working directory, and let's use the data to table as an example. If we want to know what kind of table that is, um, you know, is it a is it a feature table at all? Is it feature table frequency or presence absence? We can use this neat little tool called Chime Tools Peak. If we want to know what that does, we can always type help in. It will tell us that it displays basic information about an artifact or visualization, including its UUID and its semantic type, right? We'll clear again. We'll, I'm going to hit up so that I don't have to type all of that out pressed up twice the command line and it gave me two commands ago. And then I'll just get rid of this. And, oh, I don't remember exactly what that table was called. I will ls again, and then I'll hit up three times and type in the name of my data to table. Hit tab to complete it. Hit enter to run the command. And we can see that our table is a feature table frequency. And that, if we click back over to our documentation, is exactly the semantic type that we want to run core metrics phylogenetic. So we did great. We passed the right data in, which is why Chime 2 allowed the command to run. I'm going to click back to the, the shell now. Um, and explains why when I type ls, we not only have the three files we started with, but we also have this core metrics result directory. Now I'm sure you guys are excited to move on with the analysis, but before we leave core metrics phylogenetic behind, there are a couple of things I'd like to do. First, I'd like to explore the idea of a pipeline, and then we'll look at some of the products, the data and visualization products that Core Metrics Phylogenetic produced. So I mentioned before that this is a pipeline command that we ran. Um, what does that mean? Because it's a really powerful idea. Um, at this point, don't feel the need to follow along with me. I'm going to show you guys some, 
some images that will hopefully make the idea uh, a little easier to grasp and give you a little better sense of how powerful an idea it is. Um, so when I run Core Metrics Phylogenetic, I've clicked over to the Docs page, um, I'm putting in these inputs once, and then the command is actually producing many, many, many data outputs, a rarefied table, some vectors, some distance matrices of beta diversity calculations, PicoA matrices, um, and finally, even some visualizations that we'll look at in just uh, in the next tutorial section. Um, how did it do that, right? We're going to take a quick a quick look under the hood, um, and again, no need to follow along during this section. I'll let you know when it's time to start keeping up again. Um, this image gives you a picture of the core metrics pipeline and what it's doing kind of behind the scenes. Core metrics is just a simpler version of core metrics phylogenetic. The pipeline takes in this feature table frequency object. It then rarifies that, uh, that data. Essentially, it subsamples the data. Um, it produces these diversity metrics in the type sample data alpha diversity. It calculates a bunch of beta diversity metrics as distance matrix types. It then turns those distance matrices into PicoA results. And it uses those PicoA results to produce these emperor plot visualizations. Now, there's clearly a whole lot going on here. And all of this is happening without you having to run each of those commands separately. Instead, you type in time diversity core metrics, and you give it some inputs, and it does all of those things for you and produces all of these outputs. I think it's 17 in total. Um, now, you probably haven't actually looked at all the things that we've made yet, but we'll do that in a minute. The important thing to know is that by running one command, you can run essentially a number of different commands under the hood and produce a, a comprehensive suite of results. This raises one more interesting point, and that is that Core Metrics Phylogenetic does us a good turn by exposing this output dir parameter. So rather than having to type in a file path for every one of these 17 required file path outputs, output parameters, if we pass a, a directory name to output dir, it will ignore all of these parameters and simply put all of the things that we have produced with core metrics phylogenetic into one output dir. That's really useful for obvious reasons. It saves you typing a lot of things and thinking about stuff that isn't really important. Um, to see what that looks like in practice, we can go back to our shell. Um, and at this point, you guys can start following along with me again. I've just clicked to the secure shell tab in the browser. I will clear my display. I will use ls to look at my working directory, and we'll navigate into core metrics results using cd core metrics results. As you've seen me done a whole, do a whole bunch, I started typing in core metrics, and after a few letters, I hit tab, and it filled in the rest of it for me. Super convenient, super helpful, and it saves me a lot of typos because I make typos all the time. I hit enter, that brings me into core metrics results directory. I type ls again, you can see that every one of these inputs is something created by core metrics. And we did that, I'm pressing up just to scroll back through my command history. We did that with only this one output dir parameter and by passing it the name of a folder we wanted to put everything into. Super awesome. If we click on our workshop server tab, you can see this all looks very familiar because we haven't refreshed the page. By refreshing the page, you can see that there is a core metrics results directory here as well. I can click on that and see all of those amazing things that we produced. So what is all this stuff? 
we have produced a whole bunch of artifacts and visualizations, but looking at them here doesn't give us a very good picture of what they actually are. Now there are a few different ways of finding that out. We'll go through them very quickly. Don't worry about it if you don't follow. These are just good tools of asking uh, for asking information about the data that you have. First, we will click to the Secure Shell application. We'll clear our display. We use ls to see what's on this page. And then we will once again use chime tools peak. And this time we'll look at uh, rarified table.qza. You can see that we have a unique identifier for the artifact. It is a feature table frequency and it is in the biome v210 directory format. Now we're most interested in what this is, not how it's formatted. That's kind of information for the computer. Um, so for us, what's important is that this is a feature table. It's got a different name than the data2 table we passed in, but they're both feature tables at heart. If we were to run the same command on let's say unweighted unifrac emperor, it would tell us that it is a visualization, which is useful. That means that this QZV is something that we'll be able to look at and probably interact with to learn things about our data. That's one way of asking questions about what we've produced. Another way is by using chime tools view or chime to view, right? So I will click back on the index page for the workshop server of all of the things that we have produced using core metrics phylogenetic. And I will, let's stick with rarified table for now. I'm going to copy the address to that QZA. I'm going to open a new tab, type in view.chime2.org and hit enter. And this viewer, as I think you know already, will allow us to look at the artifacts that we've produced and learn things about them. Now this is a QZA, so we're not expecting to see a fancy visualization. We're just looking for some basic information about what is here and maybe some information about how we produced this artifact. We have citation information down below that'll be really useful when we write our paper. And up top, we have the same kind of UUID type and format information that we saw with Chime Tools Peak. This is a feature table frequency. If we click over to the Provenance tab of the visualization, we get this really cool graph that describes how we produced this rarefied table. We imported some demultiplexed sequences using the import action. We used Data2's denoise single to produce a table and representative sequences, and so on and so forth. We go from top to bottom until at this last step, we produced using core metrics phylogenetic, this feature table frequency artifact. So captured in this one little graph, you have the entire history of the artifact that you're looking at. And if later, when you're trying to figure out what you were doing a month ago, when you ran this analysis the first time, you can just look back at the graph of anything you, you produced in the provenance tab and see exactly what commands you ran to get there, including what parameters you passed. Here, it was important that we chose a good sampling depth. And you can see that we chose 2000 for our sampling depth given this data and the needs of this study. That will obviously vary from study to study, but if you're trying to reproduce your work, that can be really, really useful. Another thing that I find really valuable is this duration data point. If you're running these commands on a high-performance compute cluster, for example, at your institution, um, knowing how long it took to run the command can help you set the wall time to make sure that you get your job through 
as fast as possible without hitting the wall and running out of time. Um, and there will always be a little bit of variation from run to run, but if something takes two seconds with this much data, you know that next time running the same amount of data probably won't take you more than four seconds, right? Um, and so if you pass in a one minute wall time, you're very safe. Useful tool, um, kind of a tangent from what we're doing here. Another way to look at what you are producing in your uh, when you run something is to just look at the documentation. A little while ago, we opened up core metrics phylogenetics documentation. We'll do that again, just in case any of you are really interested in following along. But I hit back until I got to docs.chime2.org. Chime2 will, by default, fill in the current version number for you. So if you go to docs.chime2.org, you'll arrive at this page. I scrolled down to plugins, clicked on available plugins, scrolled down again to diversity, and clicked on the core metrics phylogenetic pipeline. Now we know what a pipeline is. This is more meaningful, right? What, like, we've grouped this in with the other pipelines because we know running this pipeline produces a number of outputs from the methods and visualizers grouped into that pipeline. You can then scroll down, and in this list of outputs, you can see the semantic type of each output produced. Our last stop on this like whirlwind tour of what did we make is actually in the Parkinson's mouse tutorial itself. I've clicked over to that Parkinson's mouse tutorial tab again, and I've done that because Though there isn't always a tutorial available for what you're working on at a given moment, here we have a really nice look at uh, these outputs that divides things into artifacts and visualizations. Our artifacts are essentially our data objects. They are the, the hard numbers that allow us to start inferring real things about our data and that serve as the base we can build visualizations from. Um, Walking through those very quickly, we have a rarefied table. And that rarefied table, again, rarefaction is the process of uh, random sampling without replacement from your feature table to produce uh, another feature table wherein each sample has the same number of features in it, right? And so essentially, we produce a rarefied table so that we can reduce the bias that would have been created or eliminate the bias that would have been created if we had different sampling depths for each sample. That rarefied table is used to create all of the rest of these artifacts, um, including four vectors. A faith PD vector is a vector of faith's phylogenetic diversity values. And it's called a vector because there is one value per sample. So it's essentially a long string of values, a one-dimensional string of values. Um, we also have a number of distance matrices. These are our beta diversity products. Here we have calculated the weighted unifract distance between sample 1 and sample 2, sample 1 and sample 3, sample 1 and sample 4 and the same down both axes, right? Um, we have four of those. Those distance matrix objects are turned into PCOA results. And those PCOA results are used to create the only visualizations produced by core metrics phylogenetic. Um, and lest you think that this whole core metrics phylogenetic thing was just an exercise in, um, I don't know, crunching numbers, I want to stress that we're going to come back to these visualizations many times during two of the next three sections of the tutorials I'll present. Um, we can take a quick look at one right now because they're really cool um, by going to our server, clicking on the server tab, and I'm going to pick one of these things that looks like a uh, an emperor plot QZV. Unweighted unifrac emperor would be a good one. I will right click on that, copy the link address, 
and open a new browser tab where I will go to view.chime2.org. I'll add a file from the web because this is a URL I just copied. And then I will paste it into that box, click go. And you can see that CoreMetrics produced a really neat interactive visualization of the principal coordinates of our unweighted unifrac distances. We'll get into what that means in the beta diversity section here. Um, so this is sort of just a proof of concept that we've done something really real and substantive. Some of you might be thinking right now, cool, this is a really useful and powerful tool, but what happens if I want to run a, uh, a different diversity metric? I've clicked over to the Parkinson's mouse tutorial again. And you'll notice that there are only eight metrics calculated by CoreMetrics phylogenetic. Shannon's diversity, observed features, Faith's phylogenetic diversity, PLU's evenness, Jacquard distance, Bray Curtis distance, unweighted and weighted unifract distances. Those are really critical to a lot of the work that people do in microbiome bioinformatics. But if your study requires a different diversity metric, you're not going to be able to produce that using core metrics phylogenetic. So briefly, the way you would go about that would be to use a series of other diversity tools. In this case, I'm clicking back over to the documentation page. I'm clicking the back button so that we see the list of all of our diversity commands. Um, you would use alpha, beta, alpha phylogenetic, or beta phylogenetic to produce the vector or distance matrix that you need. You would use the PicoA or PicoA biplot methods to produce the PicoA results if you are using beta diversity and trying to produce emperor plots. Um, and then you could visualize those things using the emperor plugins plot or biplot functions. You would do all of that using the same rarefied table that you produced in the core metrics phylogenetic outputs. And that way you know that you've handled the sampling bias, like the variation in sampling depth, um, already, and that you're using the same subsampled data for all of your alpha and beta diversity metrics, regardless of whether they were produced by core metrics or whether they were produced independently of core metrics. Now, if that seems like a lot, don't worry too much about it. It's not actually that complicated. Um, and there are some tools that will help. Depending on your level of programming experience, you can copy paste commands into a bash script uh, and run that repeatedly to iterate over different metrics. Or you can use the Artifact API, which gives you the full power of Python at the cost of a little bit more kind of experience required. Um, a little practice with it, though. It's extremely powerful and a really wonderful tool for, for more complex analyses. Well, I think it's time to wrap this party up. Um, and to do so, we will answer our final question in the Parkinson's Mouse Tutorial. Uh, section on core metrics phylogenetic. I've navigated back to the Parkinson's mouse tutorial tab. I'm going to scroll down to our question. Where did we get the value 2000 from? Why did we pick that value? Now this is probably starting to sound like old news, but I'm coming back to it because this is a this is a concept that's important and will raise its head a couple times in future tutorials. Where did we get the value 2000 from? Well, 2000 is our sampling depth, right? And we chose our sampling depth of 2000 back in the tutorial section on alpha rarefaction. Um, the more interesting question here is, why did we pick 2000? And at the heart of that question is, why do we choose a sampling depth at all? First, Many metrics are not capable of 
uh, handling different sampling depths across samples fairly and without bias. So we need to find some way of removing the bias that would be created if all of our samples had different numbers of features in them. We do that in this case with this kind of compromise uh, by rarifying our data, by subsampling our data evenly across samples. Kind of the bigger qu picture question though is like, what is our goal with selecting 2000 rather than 5000 or one, right? And the answer to that is it's sort of uh, practical and economic. You probably spent a lot of money on your sequencing, right? And so it's your goal to preserve as much of your data as is possible. The more data you have, the more potential you have to accurately represent the communities you have sampled from, and the more power you have to study those communities, right? And so our game, when we choose a sampling depth, is always uh, it's finding the compromise that allows us the greatest sampling depth without having to drop too many samples. There's a lot of really good information on the Chime 2 forum about how to do that. And if you find yourself trying to choose parameters for uh, subsampling your data, I strongly encourage you to check out some of the existing forum answers. Um, and at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is keep the samples that are most important to your study, preserve as much data as possible, and get your sampling depth up as high as you can without compromising in other ways. Um, I think that wraps things up here. I hope that was an informative, informative section. Um, I tried to lay the groundwork for some things we'll talk about later, and hopefully we all came away having learned something. Thanks for spending some time with me. I will talk with you all soon.